It is such a blessing to a preacher <laughs> to know that it really doesn't matter if your sermon is any good or not. <laughs> Because those notes and those words will be ringing in our ears all night. Very, very grateful for that. Uh, I went to see my financial advisor uh, not long ago. I have this plan for retirement and I wanted to find out from her if I was on track or not. So I gave her all the information and we set up an appointment and I went in and I said, okay, how are we doing? And she gave me my chances of success <laughs> and they were lower than I hoped they would be. And I was looking at it and I said, what are you calculating the death age at? And she said, 93. And I said, for goodness sake, let's do 85. I'll take up smoking. <laughs> but, but now I have a new plan. I will just come to Pepperdine and walk up and down the hill <laughs> until I die. And I, I will die in this lovely place. 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. Uh, let me just make one editorial comment. Saul is going crazy. He's descending into madness. This is a real possibility. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. I will not be discussing the ethics of that this evening. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I've come to you to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, and Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent, had him brought in. He was ready with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise up and anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. I've developed this kind of quirk in my preaching. Actually, it's always been there. I can't simply reflect on text. I have to reflect on my reflection on the text. 
uh, part of this is my postmodern training, which is basically reflecting on your reflection on reflection, which is every bit as vacuous as it sounds. Uh, but there's something more serious there too. And that is, I speak as one without authority. And you don't just need to hear me reflect about the text. You need to hear how those reflections came about because finally you have to answer to this text. You have to interpret the text and, and preachers have no right to take away that responsibility for their audiences. And part of what you're going to hear tonight is young Randy and old Randy's conversation about this text. Um, I went and uh, preached to a group of people that... For whom, to whom I was almost a total stranger. And uh, one of the people there was uh, interested enough that he started reading my books. And uh, he sent me an email asking me about something I had, I had written. And uh, this is a book I wrote a dozen years ago, and I hadn't read it. Uh, <laughs> uh, at least not recently. So I had to go and I looked up the passage and I wrote him back and I said, you know, I know the author pretty well <laughs> and he means well, but I wouldn't have said it that way. <laughs> you know, and that's the trouble with preaching and writing is you start to think about it in a different way and there's really no oopsie doopsie on that. You don't, you don't get to say that, but... The first part of this sermon, young Randy would have preached. Uh, that is, what I'm going to argue from the text, is something I'm more committed to now than I was 30 years ago. The second part of the sermon, young Randy wouldn't have preached at all. And you get to decide whether old Randy is right about it or not. As I'm looking at this text, it seems to me there are two questions I have to answer. Um, you know, Mike, Mike's kind of guiding my thinking here, and, and I said, okay, what am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do with the, with the text? And he says, well, focus on God doesn't look at the outward appearance, he looks at the heart. And so the question I have to answer is this. When God looked at David, what did he see? And then we'll get to the second question. Well, first of all, I just have to say, I'm not impressed with Samuel. Here's Samuel, and he's going to pick the first impressive thing that he sees. And he already did that with Saul, and that didn't work. going to do it again and he says no you're not looking at the right thing you have to see this in a different way when God looked at David what did he see did he see the man of war the brave and relentless warrior the rebel, the outlaw, the abuser of power, the beautiful psalm writer. When he looked at David, what did he see? And of course, there's only one possible answer to that is, he saw it all. He saw it all, and he picked him. And this is the deal. If God is going to pick a human being to be king, good and evil is both going to run through them. Because kings are human beings, and that's what human beings are like. And that's one of the things that young Randy was pretty sure about. That the single greatest theological mistake ever made in the Stone Campbell movements is that we had too high a view of human nature. I am more committed to that now than I was 30 years ago. 
and uh, dividing up the world into the purely good people and the purely bad people is a really bad idea. There may be a few on the purely bad side, but there will be nobody on the purely good side. <laughs> That's not the way it works. And our propensity to divide up the world into bad others and good us is a fundamental misunderstanding of who we are. I am not confused about the difference in a torturer and the one tortured, in an oppressor and the one impressed. I'm not confused about that. But good and evil cuts through the heart of every individual. Um, so why did he pick David? I'm going to try and answer him. One of the reasons is that the mighty work of God through God's spirit in David can never be confused with David's moral worthiness. And in fact, we'll, we'll see what we decide as, as these episodes are developed through the week. But I'll try this out for a thesis. Virtually every good thing that David does comes about because of David's humility. And every bad thing that David ever does comes about because of David's pride. When he's led by his humility, he does all right. When he's led by his pride, he does monstrous things. Um, I, I don't know how many... Uh, how many of the Psalms David wrote? That's kind of a technical question for uh, technical scholars. But I'm going to give you an approximation. Several. <laughs> he wrote several. And um, I, I've always said about theologians, if you want to know what a theologian really thinks, l listen to them preach. Uh, and if they don't preach, don't listen to them. And if you, know, if you want to know who David really is, uh, you don't have the sermons. What you've got is the poems. What you have is the Psalms. And what we see is this remarkable openness to God and for God and with God. And this openness for God and to God and with God, we have a word for that in the Bible, and that word is this, faith. That's what faith is. And despite all of his shortcomings, David believes in God. And at the risk of sounding a little too most postmodern, even when David doesn't believe in God, he believes in God. Because he takes God seriously enough to question him. You don't question somebody you don't believe in. He questions God's timing. He questions God's justice. He questions God's fairness. All of that is a testament to David's faith in God. What does God see when he sees David? He sees this incredibly flawed human being that he can use. Um, and that his glory can be shown in. He sees in him a person who at bottom has faith. Um... So what young Randy would have said, and old Randy is still saying, is um, whatever your view of human nature is, you need to lower it. Um, we all have an evil streak that flows through us. And by God's good fortune, most of us don't have the power to exercise it. 
that we have to take seriously. That it is these broken vessels that God chooses. And out of the part of the sermon that young Randy wouldn't have preached. Uh, young Randy was always very concerned because um, of Christians' tendency to read Jesus into everything in the Old Testament, whether he was there or not. And I would argue that's a fair concern. Uh, but young Randy wouldn't have asked the following question. Okay, what happens when I read this text as a disciple of Jesus Christ? What happens when I read it not just as a historical study in the Hebrew Bible to teach me something about God? What happens when I read it as a follower of Jesus Christ? And I'm not afraid of that question uh, anymore. Uh, because of my discovery that it turns out uh, Jesus is in every verse of the Old Testament. <laughs> that from beginning to end, the Bible is about God's choosing human beings to be his covenant partner. And then fulfilling that covenant in Jesus Christ. What happens when I read this story from that point of view. Well, guess what? David is a bit player in his own story. The most important player in this story is not going to be David, it's going to be the son of David. The Messiah is going to come as a human being. And that means not just finite, but having the perverse human nature that David had. And even with that, he is sinless. Now try pulling that one off. Um, my favorite uh, American uh, novelist is uh, Cormac McCarthy. Um, he wrote No Country for Old Men. Some of you have probably seen the movie. You don't know it was based on a book, but it was. Um, his most famous book is Blood Meridian, which is an incredibly violent deconstruction of the American Western. And the, the most sinister character I have ever seen in a book of fiction walks through these pages. And it reads like an almost biblical story. It has this grand, eloquent, almost scriptural style. And the person who does most of the killing in the book has no name, only a title. The Judge. And the judge kills and kills and kills. I got used to him killing the people, but when he killed the puppy, I was furious. <laughs> that story helps me. Because when the king comes, I mean the real king. The king who has the authority to judge all. He doesn't judge. He allows himself to be judged. He goes the way of the prodigal into the far country. He walks the way of humiliation. And because of this, God makes him king. The king that David could never be. The real king. The king that disses all other kings but himself. The judge who is judged. The savior of the world. And when I read this story, I see here's Samuel and God saying, not him, not him. Not him, not him, not him, not him, not him. Was that seven? 
Uh, you got any more? Yeah, one more. And he anoints David. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. I can't help thinking that I'm supposed to hear in this story the king coming and saying, I choose you. You. I want you. Have you lost your mind? Do you know what you're getting here? Oh, yeah. You're just looking at the outside. But I'm looking inside, and I see one for whom Christ died. Before you were ever born, God says, I chose you. And Jesus Christ now anoints all of his people with the same spirit that David received. He chose you. And then I have to go back to the story and I, I have to say, you know, all those brothers that didn't get picked, God picked them too. You just don't see the full story. Okay. Before the world was created, God chose human beings in Jesus Christ. And if you want to divide up the world, you don't divide it up into good and bad. You divide it up into the people who know that and the people who don't know it yet. And it's a shame not to know that. When I... Uh, when I think about that, I'm, I'm led back to, uh, to David's Psalms. Uh, I've had uh, the opportunity in the last year to have uh, uh, several uh, dealings with uh, the, the American justice system. Um, nothing to do with me. <laughs> Spent some time with a couple of pretty notorious prisoners, at least by middle Texas standards. And they aren't the monsters they're made out to be. nor are the people who sentence them the saints they claim to be. I subscribe to the definition of a saint, that is, a saint is someone whose life has not been sufficiently researched. <laughs> and I have been struck lately as I'm sure you have, by, by all the public figures who said or done things stupid in the past. And I just thank God that I wasn't important enough for anybody to listen to anything I've said. And I'd like to give them some advice. Here's what they should say. That was stupid. That was vile. That was sinful. And I'm really hoping not to do that one again. But here's the deal. There are going to be more. Because good and evil cuts through the heart of every person and when you see that God chose David and then realize in Jesus Christ the judge was judged 
to choose you. There's only one thing left to do. It's what David does in Psalms. Praise his holy name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.